I'm Chris Farrell, and this is the Good People Podcast. It's a tip of the cap, it's a pat on the back, it's a smile from ear to ear. They're the good people from around you. Welcome to another episode of the Good People Podcast brought to you by In Other Good News. My name is Andy and on this show, I get to talk to the good people of the world. Today, I'm bringing you a good person. He's a great person. He's an actor. He's a nurse. And he's also the head of operations and marketing at an amazing organization called The Hope Fund. He's played roles as the heartthrob of Ramsey Street, <laughs> Dr. Rob. And he's also played critical roles in uh, keeping the elderly safe through the pandemic. Uh and he's doing some amazing work now. And we want to talk about that today. He's going to prove to you that he's not just a pretty face. I want to welcome to the show, Chris Farrell. Welcome. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for having me, mate. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, now, oh, well, I love it when we get a, uh, a celebrity in the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's your words, not mine. <laughs> so, you know, you were Dr. Rob on Neighbours, but you're not a real doctor. No, I'm not a real doctor. You're not a real doctor. Shock horror. But you are a real nurse. I am. You are a real nurse. Um, You studied nursing a little while ago? I did. Many, many years ago. Yeah. So, it's just cool. And so, I must... I'm going to say from the outset here, it's great to have you on because we actually have some history. We do. You and I. We met uh, a long time ago. It feels like a very long time ago. Yeah. And we met when you were studying to be a nurse. I was. Before you were on Neighbours. Yes. Great memory. And we used to work at a pub. We did. Good times. Very yes. good times. And so if I can just, before we talk about like, you know, the lives you're saving and the, <laughs> and the, the successful career in acting, um, I remember you back in those days as a, as a movie nerd. I was. <laughs> you, you had a job in a video shop. I did. Your memory's in amazing. It and is it, phenomenal. And you were so excited about film. I've, I've, n- I've never met anyone more excited about film than you were. You just brought this energy. So... so um, he's a force. We want to have a chat to him, Chris Farrell. Uh, Dr. Rob from Neighbours is probably the role that you're most known for. Definitely, yeah. It's like it wasn't a huge time frame, but it um, it's surprising how many people reach out to you from watching Neighbours. Yeah. yeah. Well, good gig. Amazing. Yeah, I was over the moon. I'd worked obviously with the crew and, and the producers for some time, uh, which we can talk about a bit later. But um, yeah, so it was kind of like getting to perform amongst family and friends, which was fantastic. Yeah. And so what, what, uh, what's an interesting part of your story is that um, how nursing actually led you to that role? It did. It did. Uh, there was a lot, lot of time where I actually resented kind of having not gone down the drama um, school type of um, pathway, which a lot of people do and for, for very good reason. A lot of successful actors come out of that um, sort of pathway. But, um, yeah, it, the irony of it is it's probably the one thing that's kind of allowed me to get to where I am with my acting. Um, funny enough, it's a crazy story, but yes, I started working on film and, in film and television as a nurse, um, doing different roles in different capacities. But um, yeah, it was yeah such a great um, great way to kind of lead into acting. Yeah, and a lot of the roles that I have had have been medical roles. So maybe yeah. it's saying something about my acting. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just easy to get the guy in that kind of knows how things should be and how to set up the the scene, especially in a hospital and that sort of stuff. So really interesting. The specialist medico role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think one of my first days on set as a nurse with neighbours, um, Alan Fletcher, who plays Doctor um, Carl, everybody knows Doctor Carl. Yeah, come up and ask me a question, and it was literally like being in the Twilight Zone because I'd grown up with Doctor Carl. Yeah. Um, watching Neighbours as a kid yes. and um, I just felt like I couldn't give him any advice. <laughs> it was just like, you know what I mean? It's like, that's Dr. Carl, he can do what he wants. <laughs> yeah, He's always going to save the day. So that was a really um, fun and interesting moment, something that I'll cherish forever. Did, uh, but you had to check yourself surely at times and go, he's not a real doctor. <laughs> Absolutely. He's, uh, his ability to learn um, medical scripts is phenomenal. Really? He's an uh, absolute master. Yep. Yeah. So you went, So okay, so you're a nurse. You yeah. were, when we met, you were studying nursing. I was. But you were also writing to... You, you were still an aspiring actor at the time. Yeah, I was, yeah. So the plan was always to, you know, sort of... Not that I, I really loved nursing and I went to an all-boys Catholic high school, so it was a great transition to go to university to do nursing. Yeah. Um, that was a really good good time of my life. And um, 
but I always had a passion for film um, yeah. and storytelling and, and being an actor was always something that I wanted to do, but, um, you know, very aware of the real world circumstances of trying to pursue a career in arts, which I'm sure you've had a number of guests probably tell you about. Yeah. Um, and nursing just seemed like something that was a good fit for me because I, I love people and, and, and looking after people and uh, it's something that I could potentially travel with and support myself with um, while trying to pursue the acting. Did you ever consider that, I mean, sometimes you get told in the creative arts that, it's not really a real job. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And was that part of your decision making or? Um, yeah, probably. I, I think so. Definitely. Um, you know, well, acting in my family growing up um, where we did wasn't a real job either. Like working in the arts was just not something that anyone that we knew did. Yep. Um, and it was quite a scary thing, I guess, for my parents to think that I was going to go off and pursue that. And obviously every generation goes through changes and stuff and, um, but in the film world, definitely, you know, trying to bridge that gap was quite challenging at times um, because people tend to only see you with the hat you're wearing. And I find a lot of people and a lot of friends over the years in the industry are doing something that they're enjoying but probably have their eye and um, ambitions to do something else within the industry and find it kind of hard once they're set. Yeah. Um, because if you're good at something, um, yep. as a producer, you want to use that person for what they're good at. Yes. And rather than give them potentially an opportunity to try something else. Typecasting or step almost, up. isn't it? Kind of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So then, okay, so you became a nurse and you finished that. And then you actually went over, um, you went overseas. Or no, so you were on the Pacific. Yes, interesting enough. I was working in emergency um, at the Sunshine Hospital at the time and a friend of mine reached out to me say, hey, they're looking for people with kind of either military or medical or police type of experience um, to go out and be a part of this thing. And Right. Um, I was I jumped at the opportunity. I was like, yeah, oh, yeah. this is great. And um, I actually kind of was working for an emergency rescue company at the time that had a contract to be on the Pacific just in case any fires got out of hand and stuff like that. So I saw some colleagues kind of working in that capacity and so I started to learn a little bit about, oh, well, there's jobs outside of, you know, holding the camera or directing the actors or, or you know, setting up the lighting. Other or, roles, yeah. yeah. Other roles, right, mm -hmm. that I didn't really know about prior and you yep. probably don't learn a lot about those roles at film school. Um so, yeah, I, I jumped at the opportunity. It was amazing. It was, you know, like that was kind of my introduction into to big sets and what a set to be on. It's probably the biggest thing that happened in Australia for quite some time. Was it HBO? Was it? HBO, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you had Tom Hanks involvement and all that sort of yeah. stuff. And it was just... Big production. Amazing. And down at the Yu Yangs, like the sets were just, it felt like a war zone. It was unbelievable. You didn't have to act. It was just, it was chaos. It was, <laughs> it was amazing. Legitimately scared. Yeah, it, was, it really was. And so then that kind of seed was planted to potentially come back and... Um, go off and get some experience and then potentially try and, you know, wriggle my way into the industry yeah. in a different way yeah. um, and then hopefully make the transition over once people knew how good I was as, <laughs> yeah, yeah. as an actor. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. Prove yourself. So then you, you jetted off to London. I did, yes. And what did you study over there? You were studying... I did improvisation and a couple of other short courses um, in Around the Traps. My plan was to sort of go to drama school in London and there was a couple of... One school specifically that I really kind of had my eye on, um, but just being young and naive about the cost of living in Europe <laughs> and, uh, and the cost of going to the school, it just it didn't financially work out for me. But um, it is what it is. It's okay. I had a great time studying what I did study and um, I had a lot of really positive feedback from some of my mentors over there in London told me like not to give up and to continue to pursue it and that kept the fire alive and um, yeah, and it sort of came back home and then transitioned off. But my time overseas was just phenomenal. I was yeah. Just, yeah, I cherish it forever. Lived in Germany as well and um, bounced around to a couple other places as most young Aussies try to do and yep. uh, I just got addicted to it. So Shaped it you as a person, do you think? Definitely, I think so. Yeah, absolutely, just just living and and with different cultures and um, seeing things that you know other people did that we didn't that were amazing. Like, oh, why couldn't we adopt that? And then seeing things that I became really proud of that we probably took for granted. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, just as a human, it just it's, it's an amazing experience. I would recommend traveling for anyone. Just yeah, to get of out and you know um, just see the world. You did the Camino while you're there. A I couple, did a couple of times. Yeah, I, I fell in love with that process. Um, the Camino de Santiago is one of probably the best things I've ever done. Mm. Um, you know, physically challenging, but it's the people that you meet, and you know, it is a traditional Catholic pilgrimage. Not that everyone that does it um, is there for those reasons, but it is a spiritual journey, not necessarily a physical feat. And yep. I found a lot of younger people coming on it were really trying to kind of turn it into some ultra marathon thing to win it. To yeah, and it's not really the vibe of it. Um, so yeah, that, okay. but that was something that I had to learn that you know everyone's different and. You know, I get over and I learn a lot about myself through that process, um, good and bad. Um, definitely met a few people and helped a few people along that journey. And um, one gentleman, I won't go into massive detail, 
um, at first I kind of didn't really get along well with and um, there was a little bit of competitiveness and I thought oh, I just want to break away and have some time on my own and um, we met back up kind of later on became very very close and um, at the end of the, the journey he told me something that um, yeah I'll never forget for the rest of my life that I don't know if it's probably too deep for this, but he was saying that his plan was to end his life at the end of it. Um, mm. And that, yeah, it's quite deep, but um, through spending time with me and I guess my personality and the way I talk, look at things and tackle things, um, he's decided that he doesn't want to do that. I think that's probably the best, Jesus. one of the greatest compliments I've ever had in my life. Yeah, it moved me to tears. Like, even telling the story, I got kind of choked up a little bit, but um, wow. we're still in contact. Um, yeah, very, very intelligent guy, extremely gifted. But had a passion for you know arts and music and stuff, and that wasn't kind of his upbringing. And um, I kind of let him feel that you can still work and do all those things in academia that you're you're involved in, yeah, but you can course. pursue this stuff and you've got talent. And he sends me records that he's created, um, sends me videos of live shows with orchestras. And it's just phenomenal to see like where he is now and where he was when we met. So that's just one story, and I've got you know half a dozen of those from the, the period of doing it so that's unreal yeah people getting over the loss of family members relationships and um yeah it's it's and that's why a, people do you yeah you- mainly the, mainly they're the people that i met uh, in my time um yeah got tons of stories that are just so beautiful like that um one other gentleman from eastern europe um again We'd met earlier and, again, same sort of thing. Didn't have the best introduction to one another. I was trying to fill up some water from a tap that wasn't working and I was getting a bit nervous about how much water I had because it was a hot day and he kind of just brashly you know, looked at what I did have and you'll be fine type of thing. And I thought, oh, I don't need you to tell me you know, how much water I need. I know what I need. And I didn't see him for a while. Then the journey for most people d- does finish in Santiago de Compostela, but some people continue on to Finisterre, which is kind of the end of the world traditionally, like where you see the ocean. Okay. And that's something that I wanted to do. I heard from other people that, you know, you should do that, do the extra couple of days. And um, I powered through those extra, um, you know, I think it's a hundred and something kilometers in like two days. So I did quite a bit the, at the end just because I was on a time limit with, with flights and stuff. And I met this guy again on that last part and we got chatting and I said to him, you know, you know did you, in, have you enjoyed doing the Camino? He said, no, I'd never do it again. I said, oh, well, then why didn't you finish in Santiago? And he said to me, um, oh, caught up, he's like, oh, my wife passed away with cancer last year and she always wanted to go to see the ocean on a holiday. And I was too busy with my business and work and never got a chance to, to do it. So I wanted to see the ocean for her. And I was really moved by that. And, and, and as an Aussie, you know, yeah. you, wherever you are, it's not, you know, from major cities, wherever I've lived before, it's not that far to get to see the ocean. And we take that for granted, I think. Mm. So hearing that was just incredible to me. Mm. Um, and so we walked together and I got a little bit of ahead of him and I was walking up a hill and I could just see like in the distance through like the kind of crack between two mountains, what I thought was the ocean. So I turned around and I just started yelling to him, you know, I can, I can see it. And he, he, he dropped his walking poles and just bolted up to where I was. And it was unbelievable like two kids that have just seen santa claus for the first day he's just jumping in the air yelling the ocean the ocean i was just yelling with him i was just <laughs> in this moment with him and uh you know he had tears in his eyes i had tears in my eyes and he ran, went back grabbed his sticks ran down the hill i never saw him again he ran that quickly and got away and that was just our journey our journey had come to an end um i know i actually enjoyed bathing in the ocean on that day and it was such a moving experience so um yeah i could go on and on but i won't but yeah that they're, they're two examples of of you know examples from all along the journey so oh well thank you for sharing that like yeah. i didn't uh i don't know that side of the the camino it's so. the it is the best side yeah, yeah it is there's a lot of like you can go into the rabbit hole yep. of reading about it yep. um and and there's all sorts of things you know connected and whether you're into that or not um but regardless if you're not you're still gonna you're yeah. gonna have these experiences yeah, so they're gonna happen to you along the way that's unreal so that's obviously changed you quite a bit Definitely. um you've then got you come home yeah, you've come home, and then you know. I guess you're sort of still pursuing acting and nursing. Yes, in a way, yeah, definitely. So. Um, and then at some point here, and I'm going to say it was a strategic decision that you, after seeing what you'd seen and different career roles that you can have within film, you said, "Well, maybe I could become a nurse on the set of Neighbours." <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't that wasn't the the the, the thought process necessarily but it was potentially doing nursing in the film industry Um, and then a phone call came one day from a producer that was out at Neighbours and said hey um, you know your resume's come to me I don't really remember how that happened but um, would you like to come out and have a chat about being a nurse on set and I was like oh absolutely so I got out there and um, obviously growing up watching the show um, it was just a surreal moment 
being yeah. there for the first time and, and seeing all these faces of people that you, you recognise and saw that it was such a tight knit family. It was a bit uh, at the t- at the time it was a little bit um, nerve wracking, I guess, trying to come in and break into this um, close knit family. But I did. I got sucked in. Um, yeah. I love them all dearly, and I'm just so happy that it's continuing. And um, yeah, a role came up. My agent actually messaged me like you know, a couple of years through this process of, of being a nurse on set, saying there's a there's a small role for a, a doctor. Yeah, right. And obviously, being a nurse, you know, and working on the show, like yeah, you know, let's have a crack. You were there and you had a go. Yeah, yeah. So, like for the people who don't know, like what would an on-set nurse do? What, what's the job? Oh uh, well, it's so varied. Um, I guess from clinical nursing, people would look at it and say that's pathetic. It's not a nursing role, but um, you know, there are times where you're out at some extreme locations and there's stunts and all sorts of things going on. Uh, extreme weather. Sometimes you've got a lot of extras um, working, so you've got a lot of people um, in in extreme conditions and stuff. So you'd be surprised how often you are actually called to sort of action. Yeah. Um, but it's also preventative measures as well. So yeah, right. Um, just simple things. But um, you know, people come on set with different medical conditions that you need to know about, whether it's diabetes, allergic reactions. Oh yeah, of course. Um, there are unfortunately accidents at time because people are quite tired. You know, days on set are really, really long. Yep. And you're working on a set of a movie or a TV show. Well, Neighbours is a great example. They shoot a lot. Yep. Um, it's a lot of oh s style Well, stuff. there is, yes. Yeah. So I work, there's always a safety officer as well. So we kind of work kind of in tandem at times, yep. um, especially yep. if it's we've got a lot lot of area to cover. So yep. Yep. Um, they put a lot of trust in me and likewise put a lot of trust in them. So that's, um, that's an interesting collaboration on set, safety and nursing. Yeah, for sure. So then, I mean, you're around there. It's all pretty intimate, I guess. Yeah, time. it is. Yeah, you're in there. So then the, the role comes up. Yeah. And you, so you give it a crack, Dr. I, Rob. I do give it a crack. And I've got to thank um, Scott McGregor, who played uh, Mark Brennan. I actually pulled him uh, off set one day and asked him if he'd help me with the self-test because I wasn't actually the, kind of crazy. But they were auditioning in the studio, which wasn't um, – so in the casting director um, – office which wasn't actually attached to neighbors anymore had moved into um albert park in melbourne so it would have meant that i'd have to actually leave my job on set to go and audition which wasn't going to be cool yeah, yeah, yeah. um because they needed me so i asked my agent if i could just shoot a self-test and i knew the director that was going to be taking or agreeing to the person to play that role yep. and asked whether he would see um, a self-test and he asked me if it's for me so the answer was yes, yeah. which is great. <laughs> yeah. um, so then, yeah, Scotty and I went away and, and shot it, and I guess that helped in some way of, of seeing the audition and hearing his yeah. voice. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, things just aligned, and, and I had a lot of people supporting me in the background. Once the writers found out that I was cast in that, they were really keen to give me an opportunity and, and write me back in, and, and, and Jason Herbison, one of the producers on Neighbours, is such a lovely guy, and, yeah. and you know, he, he'd supported me through the journey the yeah. whole time and had always said to me that, you know, he, he'd seen me in something else before and had remembered and would, would try at some point to yeah. potentially help me out. And, um, yeah, I'm forever indebted to them. Yeah. it's Well, um, and you can check all this. You can check out your reel on the IMDb as well. <laughs> Don't there's do some that. good bits here. So there's one bit there uh, for the fans. One bit there where you find yourself in a sticky situation when you and your onset girlfriend, Amy... Yeah. Uh, get caught shagging in the uh, in the um, construction Just, site. Yeah. <laughs> it was and you a, get caught by um, <laughs> by what's his name? Paul Robinson. Paul Robinson. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> so yeah, how many episodes in were you before you had to get your kid off? <laughs> well, this was the I guess probably every actor's worst nightmare. So I was probably a much fitter in my early years working there before getting on camera and then just getting older and lazier and then getting, you know, time poor, probably lost a little bit of fitness. Um, from when I first started on the show and my kind of return after some time away between the character first being introduced and this happening was quite some time and I didn't get a lot of notification around that <laughs> happening. So there was just no time to start trying to get fit. And then it was kind of like, is that my ego and, and my you know, self-consciousness as an yeah. actor versus the character? And I thought, well, you know, if the, if the character was a triathlete or someone that, that, that demanded that physical shape... Yep. Uh, you know, definitely would have wanted the time to, to get back in shape if I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things with acting at the moment. I'm, um, t- I've got just auditioned for two different characters and they're very, very different. One's overweight quite clearly in the script yep. and the other one is um, uh, an ex-soldier with PTSD who's um, a bit of a meth addict. I can't go into too much detail of both of those roles, but but polar opposites in terms of physicality. Yeah. That's one of the things that we, we face. But So, yeah, it wasn't... You might my, have to go full Christian Bale. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, if you did both in the time frame that they're asking, it would absolutely be something like that if you were, if you were up for it. I'm not saying that I could do it, but um, yeah, so that, that those scenes were probably really hard. And, and you, you know, like you're almost naked 
in front of colleagues. Yeah. So it's it's like that dream. You know, when you have that dream and you're yeah, like yeah. You're up on stage doing the speech and you look out to all these people that you know and you're completely nude. That was kind of like a reality. Yeah. Uh, so that was nerve wracking and it was a great challenge for me to, to, to try and block that off because the character yeah. is not self conscious at all. It's having a great time. Yeah. Um, so it's really important that I kind of, you know, stuck with that. Yeah. So you can catch that a little bit of that clip on uh, the IMDb. That's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, Christopher Farrell, actually, you're on uh, on the IMDb. Yeah. I think sometimes casters, uh, sometimes in credits, it'll be Chris Farrell and, and Christopher. I don't really stipulate that, but I guess my full name is Christopher. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. where it comes up. So then, um, you know, you had your ups and downs there, but you've probably made the, the, <sighs> Maybe not the most dramatic, but certainly one of the funniest exits from <laughs> yeah. neighbours that exist, right? Some people Definitely. get blown up. Definitely. The Harold, Harold gets thing. washed away or something. Yeah. But do you want to just quickly tell us how Dr. Rob went out? Uh, yeah, okay. So he was asked by um, Shane, one of the characters, who plays Toadie's brother, uh, to endorse um, a product, uh, a revolutionary product to turn <laughs> urine into drinkable water. I think it was called Tinkle. <laughs> um, and he wanted the endorsement of a doctor. And, of course, I wanted to try and get back with my partner. This was Amy. Amy, which yes. I was really sad and brokenhearted about breaking up with. So, yep. of course, I agreed to try and get in the good books by helping out her friends. And, um, yeah, got up on stage to do this whole um, spiel about you know how it's safe and don't don't be afraid of it. It's great. And yep. um, see for the first time that Amy's actually with um, Damien, um, who was playing Gary Canning, Um Damien Richardson's the actor. He's a phenomenal actor. And um, he was playing Gary Canning at the time, that they were actually together. And I'd had no idea about it. It was completely oblivious. And then to see them sort of kissing, like crying right in front of me mid-spiel, just kind of lost my cool. Dr. Felt, Rob lost it. Do- Dr. Rob lost it. Felt really stupid for having no idea and feeling like everyone in the community knew. Oh. And so, yeah, I just felt like the best thing to do was to grab the the hose that was connecting the the <laughs> unfiltered urine and just give everyone a bit of a you know a once over and uh so yeah it was one of probably one of the coolest things that i've ever had to do and it was a really cold morning and i remember that they were arguing about who dr rob would probably go for more because there was it was freezing cold no one to get no one wanted to cop it um So yeah, that was that was good fun. So you sprayed everyone with urine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can come back from that, but I'm sure people have come back from worse things. On oh, the show. of course they have. Yeah, Harold come back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's hilarious. I I really like that story. It makes me laugh a lot. Um, I I've never heard of a funnier exit. So oh, it's great. And one of the things that people ask me about is that exit, and you know, like they ask me questions about after that moment and stuff like that, but. Just um, what a way to go. It's brilliant. Yeah, what a way yeah. to go. Now, the other thing too, like um, because often neighbours, people might um, talk about neighbours because it is a soapy and it's mm-hmm. on all the time and it, it's not for everyone. Yeah. Um, but you talk very fondly about neighbours as, as, a, as a production. Yeah, for sure. And, and what it means for the people that are in it and working on it and stuff like that. Like, Correct. Do you want to elaborate on that? Because you told me some really interesting stuff on that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think... First of all, working with the crew and working with them for so long, I get to see every aspect of how the show's made, and so my respect goes up, you know, tenfold. Um, not to mention that in Victoria, Neighbours for many, many years was the only real stable job, you know, for for a lot of crew members. So yeah. there's a lot to be said by that, and I think actors that come with the wrong attitude towards it probably need to kind of rethink themselves um, in terms of a what an honour it is to be cast in anything because your competition is so massive. Yep. Um, B, this thing's been running for an extremely long time yeah. for a reason. There is a fan base out there that love it and respect it and you should respect it too. Mm. Um, and also, if you look at the time period of Neighbours, there's been some absolutely phenomenal performers come through. Yep. Um, and I was lucky enough to work with a few of them and I was just in awe of coming there and, and, and getting to work with like the likes of Katie Kendall who um, played Laura Turner who I was a huge fan of and just loved the way she went about the business. It's so oh, just phenomenal. Mm. Um, Rob Damien, Mills. Yeah, Millsy, yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. right. You've so, done some great things with Millsy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get along really, really well. Um, we actually walked the Oxfam Trail Walker together, so raised, I think, around about $15,000, yeah. mostly to Millsy, <laughs> um, which was amazing. So we got to know each other really well um, through that process. But, um, yeah, we both got a love for footy, um, you know, telling stories. And yeah. I thought Rob... His uh, dedication to the character was phenomenal. I yep. think in one of my earliest scenes, actually, I stitched up his head because he had a bit of a fall. And <laughs> his character again had some really amazing storylines as well. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, some some um, big names, and some of them have played in everything else since. Like um, 
the underbelly guys and the absolutely got you look at you know you go right back you look at guy pierce and russell crowe had a small stint on there as well and um you know margot robbie's a great example of oh, someone from the modern day that's dominating going to really really dominate and yeah you know, home and away is very similar as well you know chris hemsworth's probably the biggest at the oh, moment yeah, yeah. um isla fisher then there's you know melissa george is still doing some amazing stuff over there and yeah they're really great performance and great actors and i think um you know the show tries to cater to as many people as possible so sometimes they're going to get that casting right and other times not and every act every actor's human sometimes you have a bad day i know yep. i was extremely nervous um when i was transitioning into being in front of the camera in front of everyone and um scott major who um, was a an actor on um neighbors for some time also like heartbreak high and stuff a seasoned veteran actor who was directing neighbors when i arrived uh, i actually went up to him for some advice we got along really well he directed me in some of my early episodes but I will never forget this. I asked him whether or not he was nervous about that transition from actor to director. And he knew instinctively, because um, he's you know, so emotionally intelligent, lovely, lovely guy, knew exactly what I was saying, what I was trying to say. Yeah. And he, he got it and he just said, absolutely. Gave me some really, really lovely advice and, and told me you know, honestly how he felt and understood what I was going through and gave me some real confidence in like, you know, you've got this. He knew where I studied and, and what I'd sort of been doing with theatre and stuff over the years and some of the people that I um, lived with and knew quite well, he knew as well. So he kind of knew that I was serious about it and then I wasn't no mucking around. Yep. Um, so that really helped. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and so, oh, actually, I was just thinking the other day, where I saw you... Uh, very recently in the uh, in Utopia. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're in episode one of Utopia. I was. It's excuse me. Sorry. It was. Um, that was such a great moment. Um, obviously through COVID, a lot of things shut down, and so there wasn't a lot of opportunity around. And, and actors were really kind of trying to do whatever they could. And um, we had we found that like a lot of really big name actors came home because you know some of the industry was still going at times when other parts of the world were closed. So the the demand or the the potential for like decent actors with you know really good names big names in the industry that would come back and kind of do small roles because they could and then it's an opportunity to come back home meant that the, the competition was raised even more so um, there wasn't a lot on for me during that period and i was working in another capacity um through COVID, which i can get to at some other point so when the call came through for utopia i was over the moon and i grew up with um a mutual friend of, of yours as well, Juzzy Anderson. Oh, yeah. So episode three, Justin Anderson. There you if go. You, if you want to go back and have a look. Yeah, yeah another yeah. actor. Yeah. Yeah. So I know Juzzy quite well as well. And um, knowing that him and his brother Nick were a part of the late show and, and that working dog crew. And Rob Sitch is one of my all time favorite, you know, yeah. not just actors, but writer, director, producer. He's the he's the full package. So yeah, yeah. Um, to have an opportunity to be in Utopia in, in any way, because, you know, to some people that would be kind of a small role. And I know my agent was kind of like, you know, do you want to do it or not? And I'm like, are you kidding? I'll do it for free. Like I just, yeah, to be a part of it. And such a great show. It's so funny. It's just, it and, hilarious. and it's just on, it's on the money. So yeah, I had a, a really great experience with them. Um, again, they're a tight knit family, but they're so welcoming when you walk in, you just, they instantly make you feel like you're a part of the team. Yep. Um, and I can't speak highly enough of, of my day out there with the, with them. Um, I really hope that they continue to go again. Yeah, there you go. So check out episode one. Uh, you're delivering a message about the freeway. I think. Yeah. And the, the, you know, the great <laughs> thing was we were just, we weren't far from here, actually. We were just up at, at the end of sort of Geelong Road, just where it goes off to the freeway on towards Geelong. For those who don't know the area, it's um, there's a bit of construction going on. They're building a, a business precinct in there. Yep. But you got the freeway in the backdrop, so it was a beautiful setting. Um, at one point in time, I don't know if we, we probably didn't get set up quick enough, but it was early in the morning. There was still a lot of banked up traffic. Yep. So I thought, oh, how funny if we can get this, uh, this traffic in the background when I'm, talking about how good this is going oh, to be, the how good it is. And, <laughs> and it was just, yeah, it was hilarious. There were times where I was really trying not to not to laugh with just some of the, the banter and some of the, the you know, the um, the script was just so funny. Yeah. Yeah, really, really well done. Yeah, it is. A, it's a hilarious show. So check it out. Oh, I'll check the whole thing out, but uh, mm. keep an eye out for the guy on the TV yeah. in episode one. That's hilarious. So, yeah, you were talking about how um, you had to make a decision or you had to make some choices and reassess your acting career because of COVID. Yeah. Um, that made – you had to make some big choices. Definitely. Um, that obviously lent more towards the nursing. Yeah, for sure. Um, you were about to go overseas? Yes, I was. Actually, yeah, great, good memory. Um, yeah. yeah, I had a, um, a Canadian visa and I was going to go over there and sort of try in the, the US-Canada market. Yep. Um, sort of, yeah, had those plans to move and, and take that over there. And then obviously COVID started and – 
I got into COVID quite early, I think, you know, the alarm bells ring for me quite early when we weren't really talking about it here and sort of started to really go back to um, infection control, which was something that I really enjoyed through my clinical time and, and through study as well. And um, did a course through London School of Hygiene, which is really interesting, um, and started really preparing to um, potentially go in and help. And um, yeah, obviously we all know the story, got quite bad and started to... Um, consult with a number of different areas and industries um, around like COVID safe practices and trying to prevent, you know, outbreaks and all that sort of stuff. And, and then, yeah, got some phone calls to potentially move into aged care uh, and help directly manage outbreaks and, and bring them to a head as quick as possible. And it was extremely overwhelming to begin with um, yeah. and a great learning curve for me as well. Just obviously as a clinician, you tend to just focus on, you know, the, the medical side and what you need to do for your patients and not, not really get involved in political stuff. And all of a sudden I was in a position where governance and, you know, policy and all that sort of stuff was really starting to clash. Yes. And I call a spade a shovel and, and being on the ground, I didn't really like some of the stuff that I was forced to deal with because mm. it was taking me time away and it was a bit contradictory at the time. So it was a little bit messy. But overall, I think, you know... Um, in, in hindsight, I think we did a really incredible job and, and everyone working through that um, time in those you know, in hospitals or aged care homes or whatever, um, as far as I'm concerned, just you know, saints, lifesavers, because they're yeah. putting their life on the line. Um, every day. Every day. We tend to forget that now because um, vaccination's been so successful and people tend to like forget about it. But mm. you know, if you've worked through that, that period, um, it's something you'll never forget. Oh, well, very stressful. But also the um, rapidly changing... Um like all the rules and changes, every day there'd be new rules and changes for um, protocol and whatnot. So Spot you'd be on. adapting to that all the time. Definitely. And criticising it if it wasn't working, um, yep. which I was fond lucky enough to have um, the backing of a few senior people in, in different areas, not just like in the aged care and hospital se sector. And we kind of, we teamed up. There was a few infection control um, nurses and professionals that got together um, in a small committee um, quite, quite early in the piece where we would, potentially put our voice to, to things that we, we saw coming from government policy that probably didn't translate well to the aged care sector. Hospital setting is very different to an aged care home. Um, it is their home. Mm. You know, they've got a lot of personal belongings. Their room is their, their home. They so live there, yeah. yeah. You're basically asking to you know move out of their home and go into a foreign area and m remove all their belongings, all this sort of stuff. And um, there, there was risk involved, but as we learned through the process, there's also other risks that we need to take into consideration, mental health and all these other things. So it was a tricky um, a tricky scenario and trying to get the balance, sorry, trying to get the balance right didn't always work, but I think, you know, everyone's intention was was in the right place. Yeah. Yeah, it must have been a hell of a time um, to get through that. So then, um, I mean, you've kept, in theory, you've kept a lot of old people safe through that period there. Yeah, I like to think so. Yeah, we I did quite well. Like, There's not a, thing, a lot of things in my career I can say I did really well and really proud of, but that that time absolutely like some of the outbreak times when i first sort of began in aged care towards the end part and how quick i was able to sort of you know educate people and um i think getting the buy-in from staff was quite difficult at the beginning because there was a lot of conspiracy theories going around and um a lot of different opinions about you know elderly people in this position and stuff and i was having none of it so yeah. um yeah, it took, it took me a while and I struggled at the beginning and I'll never forget, um, I worked with one cleaner in my first outbreak who worked for an agency, so he moved around and um, the attitude of some of the staff there towards me wasn't very good. Uh, I didn't take it very well. It was a learning curve for me as well. But we actually worked together again in like sort of outbreak number five or six and um, he came up to me and he just said, oh, I want to thank you um, from the bottom of my heart, from my family for everything you've done like and and kind of admitted that you know the way they saw me at the beginning they now realize the approach that i was taking and why i was taking it and yeah. how much it meant to him and i was i was really moved by that um and yeah. i and i gave him um the respect that he deserved by saying you know look look at how far you've come as well and just reinforcing how important they are because you know, in an outbreak anyone that walks into that setting is important if you're not important you don't need to be there you, it's much safer not to be there yeah of course so just reiterating to them like the the, the part that they have to play in that process is vital. Um, so that was, yeah, it was a really rewarding um, time of my life, challenging time of my life as well. But I'm glad to have been able to, to give something 
um, rather than sort of just sitting back waiting for the acting stuff to or, or getting upset that I'd lost my opportunity to, to yeah, move that's to Canada because right. my age had changed through that period of time and yep. I, I couldn't apply now for that same visa given my age and yeah. all that sort of stuff. A little bit of sliding doors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. A bit of sliding doors moment. But now, so now, um, I mean, you're now sitting in a role as the... Um, Operations and marketing chief at the uh, Hope Fund. Yeah, yeah. It's- so, so I guess probably, and this is um, what I love about this is because you are a nurse and an actor, but also now you're you are working with an incredible organisation who's trying to do some really great things. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about the Hope Fund. Yep. Right, and tell us about that. What you're doing there, and then we'll have a talk about your role and, and yeah, why it's so important yeah. yeah for sure so i guess like the hope fund we're trying to like improve our um, patients you know journeys and outcomes through education and research mainly um, we deal mainly with upper gastrointestinal upper gi um, liver and pancreatic um, patients yep. mainly cancers so esophageal cancer stomach cancer pancreatic cancer um, liver cancer a lot of cancers that don't get the publicity that others do and sure. it's really kind of weird to say this but um Cancers with more publicity tend to get more money. Yes, of course. And they're not always the ones that are doing the most damage. So pancreatic cancer, for example, is um, in most parts of the world, it's kind of up there in like top sort of two or three, um, you know, in terms of deaths and, and numbers. So it's a, it's a nasty, nasty cancer and doesn't get a lot of money for research. So um, unfortunately, that's what we're trying to do is trying to raise money so that we can continue to make research and uh, do research and, and make some changes to help our patients get better outcomes for yeah. their journeys. Yeah. Um, and it's yeah, it's just it's a phenomenal organisation with some absolute superstars um, on the board, and I've just yeah so honoured and privileged to be a part of it. And I had one of the one of the questions from someone interviewing me at one point was like, so why do you really want to be here? It's like I just want to be on the team, you know. Like obviously I'm not nowhere near as intelligent or skilled enough to even fathom like that. You know, and these people they're amazing. Like they just they think they take for granted how special. Yeah. It is what they do. Like they're and surgeons and... Yeah, they they've done hundreds of surgeries. Some of them, like maybe into the thousands, probably just take for granted what they're doing. Yep. Um, and it's just because they're so good at it and they just do it all the time. But and these are, these are the board members, so... Yeah, there's a few board members. Yeah, not all. set it but, up. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of the origin, original founders are still there. And um, yep. yeah, it's sort of started off as the Surgeons Impact Fund. Um, so really, hi- highly qualified... Extremely, medical practitioners extremely yeah. qualified mate yeah, yeah like yeah. they're yeah they're just the best of the best so yeah um so some of my job in terms of marketing is to help them you know um sort of speak about what they're doing and feel confident to be coming on to like podcasts or doing some webcasts and um you know showing them how much of an impact that can have and how we can sort of you know yep. get the brand out there and, and raise awareness and raise more money and we have some really great uh, events on the calendar for raising money. The gala's one. It's probably our biggest event of the year, which was in April. And I kind of just sort of birth by trial by fire started like a week or two just before yeah. the gala. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it was phenomenal. We had some amazing people there and um, raised some, you know, some lovely, you know, raised some good money and, and raised some, you know, great awareness for, for the cause. And, and some of the research they're doing, you know, is really starting to, um, you know, have some great outcomes and um, get people yeah excited for the future. So we're really trying to just expand and grow. Yeah, for sure. And I think what, from what it sounds, you can correct me here, but from what I'm getting, it feels like your role, it's really important um, because it helps bridge the difference between some some really intelligent high-level medicos, medicos yep. um, and integrating that language into language that people can understand spot on so that so that people can understand what it is that you're actually doing spot on yeah and that's exactly right yeah so it's really kind of translating that to to sort of hit the 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 biggest audience that i possibly can and um first and foremost like i said patients that have you know gone through that journey and and their family members are, are probably number one but i think just raising awareness um in the community for for cancers that maybe don't get as much attention as well um and hopefully getting them on board and getting them to buy in or different individuals or organizations that potentially want to partner with us and and help us continue to grow that research team and you know and really um progress the research as far as we can and, and help as many patients as possible but yeah that's pretty much really in a nutshell yeah that's a good point which is a, it's a really important thing because often like i mean when you're that educated it's often difficult to translate that into well, yeah. digestible information correct and also there's running a charity there's heaps of other facets other than just the the research or the working with the patients there is the branding there is the marketing there is the business um acumen and 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 trying to you know reach out to you know corporate donors or or organizations and finding that loophole like what makes us 
um, stand out amongst the rest because there's no shortage of great causes and charities out there. And yeah. um, that landscape, it, it's, it's beautiful, but it is, it is competitive, you know, especially as, you know, cost of living goes up and interest rates go up and rents go up. And of course. Uh, it makes it hard, I guess, for people to find that extra money to sort of give. Um, and so that's a part of the role as well. So yeah, it's sure. a multifaceted role. There's also the governance, a lot of things that you need to, uh, make sure are in line to be in an official um, sub fund or charity, depending on which bracket you're in, and so that that's a part of what I do as well. And I've I've, I've obviously had that experience through the aged care um, time that I bring to the table. And so there's, yeah. Yeah, I'm a kind of a weird candidate for the role, but as um, the chair of the board had said to me, you know, kind of like your background, as weird as it sounds on paper, yeah. and it had gone against me at times. Yep. For this role, kind of it works. worked really well. Yeah. 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 The public recognition factor of, um, of an individual um, that you could sort of leverage off in this capacity is, is, is mind-blowing. You know, like you think about how many charities you know because of a person that's yes. got it, whether it's breast cancer or it's MND or whatever. Yeah, of course. Um, so that's a huge part. And obviously I, I have that experience in the film and TV landscape and um, can potentially reach out to a few people that have that public recognition factor that might want to help us out and, mm. and um, put their voice to it that would really help, you know, sort of push things forward. A few words from... Um, from a from the right person, absolutely, can really help. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So that's part of one of the um, one of the things, one of the projects that I've started is like personal experiences and journeys from patients and family members, and yep. um, adding a human touch to it. Yeah, um, because the, the real people. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly right. Yeah, because like the you know the re- and that's a that's a tough one as well because you know not everyone has the confidence to. Or, or the desire to sort of put their story out there and you don't know how many people are going to see it and all that sort of stuff. So yep. the ones who do that are, are courageous, but it has a huge impact. Um, you can't, yeah, I can't underestimate the impact of like, you know, getting a letter in the mail, you know, asking a charity for donations, seeing a real story, a yes. real photo of a real person. Yeah, that's it right. connects you connects to you in a way that's just much better than just, you know, words on paper. Yeah, 100%. It's got to, it's got to be real and it's got to be tangible. Um, you mm. were saying you were doing um, some research into instead of... Uh, so people who just recently had cancer mm-hmm. um, procedures or surgery. Yes, yes. Um, putting them... Instead of saying resting up... Yeah, yeah. Putting them through high-intensity training. Yeah, it's, it sounds like an odd thing because most people associate... Um, it's called HIT for short, so high-intensity interval training. You yep. might have seen like your Mark Wahlberg's, Chris Hemworth type guys doing Yeah, there's plenty of stuff. gyms do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly right. So... You, to, to think about that in a hospital with a, uh, a patient who's just had surgery for cancer, <laughs> yeah. it probably sounds a bit odd, but um, yeah, yeah. the results are amazing. Um, the people that are working in it are absolutely phenomenal. It won like, Research of the Year at St. Vinny's a couple of years ago. Um, I probably won't do it justice in terms of talking about it into its great depth, but the impact it's having on the patients that we, we're working with has been phenomenal. You know, right. men, men, mental health, um, obviously muscular, you know, preventing um, deterioration, all that sort of stuff. Yep. It's, um, yeah, it's having a really huge impact and um, people – are actually donating specifically to that. So on our website, with you, if you click on the donate button, you can actually add a comment. Some people will write, you know, well, I want to sponsor, you know, two, three patients, whatever it is, with my two hundred dollars or whatever um, for the hit project. Yeah, yeah, sure. Which we can absolutely do. And that's on your and that's on the website, thehopefund.org.au. Yeah, exactly right. So on there you can donate. And now when you donate, you can choose what it goes to. Yeah, you, well, there's a you, there's a comments area. So if you wanted to sp- specify um, a project, so if you go on the research um, part of our website, you can see the different research that we're doing, and yep. you can make a comment there, and we could we could try and allocate that money specifically to it. Um, otherwise, we'll just you know it'll get branched in the pool. Different, different, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And have you got any big? What do you want to do there? What do you want to do there? I want to grow it. I want to you know I'd be so, I'm just so proud to be a part of it as I said before, and um, I'd, I'd really love to grow it into um, something big and and to be a part of um, research that you know has groundbreaking changes in in any one of these areas that you know could be used universally to save lives or um, you know prevent um, major loss or improve um, outcomes for people that have had surgery. That to me is is huge. So yeah. definitely grow it um, and, and take on more people and eventually, you know, get, you know, more um, volunteers and, and and impact on more patients, you know, outside of Victoria and inter- interstate in Australia and then hopefully internationally. Yeah, sure. So at the moment it's impacting mostly Victorians. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think we've had um, some of the um, doctors and stuff have, have collaborated overseas and, and stuff like that um, and a couple of projects have a lot of interest uh, around, the, around the world. Um, one in particular, AI in medicine, it's quite interesting and, uh, AI is kind of the buzzword at the moment, yeah, so is, that's yeah. getting a lot of tension. And uh, but yeah, definitely in terms of like the day to day in in hospital um, patient care and uh, education, yeah, Australia wide would be great. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, once you've got those, well, I mean, those technologies allowed you to go 
worldwide. Yeah. Now yeah. That's, that's what the way it is. Exactly it? right. Yeah, exactly right. There's people performing surgery, practicing across the other side of the world now. And It's funny that you mentioned that. Um, yeah, one of the projects that we're, we're potentially trying to raise money for is like a, a specialized headset. And I'm, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not gonna do this justice for the creators or, or the people <laughs> using it. But the idea is that um, a surgeon sitting in an office in a hospital in Melbourne yes. could be watching the surgeon in, say, Kenya and Africa or whatever, um, and, and guide them through or, or be a, an assistant and see everything they're doing in real time. And I mean, that's just... It's stuff that we would have watched as a kid in the movie and gone, well, that's so fun. So they can sort of mentor sci-fi. them mentor them through mentor the surgery. Mentor them, help them through the through yeah. it, prevent you know, potential, yeah, you know, errors, human errors in surgery and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, yeah so the, where the technology is going in, in, in and healthcare is amazing. That sort of thing, that, that's unreal, isn't it? It is, it is, yeah. yeah it's exciting stuff. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I, I wish you all the best with that. I Thank mean, you. obviously, I'm really, um, obviously, we love, you know, your roles on neighbors yeah. and 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 all of your acting stuff and that's that's great for your your personal role uh, personal growth and that sort of thing as well but you're making a huge difference with the hope fund thank you and so you know keep up the great work and and we'll always get behind stuff like this so yeah no thank you for having me it's just an honor to be a part of a podcast you know like this um i think what you do is great um i've enjoyed listening to you know multiple podcasts that you've done and so you've had some absolute cracker people on. So to be a part of it is just, um, yeah, it's great for me. So thank you very much. Oh, no, you're, you're more than welcome. And it's great to have an old mate yeah. back. It's it's really funny. We've gone apart for a while and we've come back together and yeah. it's really great to see you. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I could have walked here today, which is crazy. Yeah. That's a, well, when I found out you're actually only down the road, that made me laugh. I, I yep. said, you've got to be joking. Yeah. He's only down the road. Yeah. I felt a bit lazy driving here, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Did a U-turn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Traffic was hell. I had to do a U-turn. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, I'm late, mate. Yeah, it's yeah, been yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, uh, Chris Farrell, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I've had a, had a great time. You can check out uh, thehopefund.org.au. Yep. Yes. And also jump on IMDb and check out uh, Chris's work, Christopher Farrell on IMDb. Uh, well, episode one of the Utopia at the moment is one of the ones, oh, but yeah. you've got a bunch of stuff, so check it out. Um, and I wish you all the best with all your upcoming roles as well. Thank you so much, mate. Yeah, hopefully I, I bag one of them and uh, get to have some fun. Well, I hope you don't get overweight plus underweight at the same time. No, I'll take the underweight. I think my partner would prefer the underweight. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, for sure. Although, yeah, the other roles, <laughs> it, it's so much fun. I can't talk too much about it, but um, yeah, they're both absolute crackers and it's just good to be in the mix. Surely overweight. To get there is easier than underweight. Oh, much more fun. Oh, yeah. I, I actually, to be, honest, neglect. to be honest, like I had just done, I think, roughly under a week to prep. And I sort of said to the agent, I'd gone the opposite for the other audition and kind of like really tried to knock it back, which is hard for me because I don't eat very well. And um, so I lost, I did, I lost a couple of kilos for, for the other audition. And then I was like, oh, God, what do I do? I'm like, do I put it back on? <laughs> And um, so, so nuts. Which is hundred yeah, percent popcorn chocolate. My partner's really upset. <laughs> We're about to go on, on a holiday uh, and see some of her family in Spain, and obviously <laughs> want me to look as good as I can. Um, and I'm just there smashing it down. And it, it was unbelievable how much you can you buy poor eating. And I'm not promoting that, especially working with the Hope Fund. No, do not or as a nurse. Yeah, or as a nurse. Yeah, you yeah. know, don't do that um, mm. unless you absolutely have to. And then yep. as soon as you can stop, revert back. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and always get some guidance from a nutritionist or a doctor if you are trying to do that. Um, yep. So yeah, that was a bit of fun. Yeah, well, good on you. Hope you get one of them. Thank you, mate. Yeah, thank you. I'll um, I'll let you know. Definitely. Yeah, please, please do. Uh, this has been the Good People Podcast. My guest today, Chris Farrell. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, of course, if you're watching this, please like and subscribe. It helps us so much. Uh, make comments. Tell us what you think. Uh, do you enjoy listening? If you do, make sure you let us know. So, um, otherwise, tell your friends as well. Tell your friends about the Hope Fund and please do tell them about the podcast. It all helps us so much. So. Chris Farrell, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been the Good People Podcast. Until next time, adios. Well, it's a tip of the cap. It's a pat on the back. It's a smile from ear to ear. They're the good people from round Two a few.